more conservative fundamentalist Muslim circles, what are deemed progressive Islamic views are given a lot of negative flack in a manner somewhat akin to how so-called orthodoxy speaks about the Qadrajites and their beliefs. Though unlike the Qadrajites, progressive Islamic movements are far from extinct with aspirations of injecting ways of thinking into the religion of Islam in line with what they believe its original message had intended from the start. So on, so here with me on this installment of Real Talk with Tehran Pool, in order to give a synopsis on progressive Islamic thoughts, he is a senior lecturer in Islamic studies at Griffith University, Australia, where his work and research is mainly centered on contemporary Islam with special focus on the theory of progressive Islam, Salafism and religious extremism, Islam and gender, Western Muslims identity construction and interfaith dialogue theory and practice. Assalamu alaikum and thank you Dr. Duderija for accepting my invitation for a discussion on what I believe to be one of the most mischaracterized as well as misunderstood modes of thinking within contemporary Islamic thought. Wa alaikum as salam uh, Aaron, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you here today. Thank you for reaching out. As you said, there's quite a bit of mischaracterization and perhaps uh, misinformation about the academic theory of progressive Islam. So I look forward to um, engaging your questions and, and reaching out to your audience, hopefully in presenting a more accurate picture of, of progressive Muslim thought, at least in the manner I have tried to characterize, delineate, uh, and, and delineate it over the last 15 to 20 years now. And although I believe a considerable amount of my audience might be very much aware of who you are in your scholarship, uh, just for those who aren't so much aware, uh, concerning yourself, as with all my guests, I'm always interested in what led them in the direction we find them at currently. So from what I understand, you were born into a Muslim family. And I really don't like asking the question if someone was raised in a religious household or not, because, you know, although that type of thing can be subjective, but was the topic of religion frequently discussed during your upbringing? If not, then at what point in your journey did you start cultivating an interest in religion and all that's involved with it? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, socialist Yugoslavia. So uh, my Muslim identity was very much based on my cultural identity. Uh, so religion in socialist Yugoslavia in general was something that was discouraged, especially the public demonstration of religion mm. was highly discouraged. So it was kept um, um, basically as a private affair. So our family would uh, stick to a, a more cultural approach to, to religion and celebrate only the major uh, festivities associated with, with Islamic tradition. Um, so yeah, um, due to due to the conflict in, in, in the in the Balkan regions in the early to mid 1990s, eventually I found myself in Australia. Mm. It's a long story, but um, at, at, an, at an age of 18. So Eventually, I started going to university and uh, became active in the Muslim Student Association at my university, University of Western Australia. And it is there that I came across, um, you know, lots of international students, as we, we call them here, overseas students coming from different parts of the Islamic world. At that time, I already had a keen interest in, I wanted to explore my Muslim identity more seriously. and. Uh, I came. I, I started basically on my own reading academic books. I remember one of the very few, fir, very first Muslim scholars that I was studying was Fazur Rahman, mm -hmm. the Pakistani intellectual and scholar, um, uh, who died in 1988. So my introduction to Islam was um, through uh, uh, academic voices, mm -hmm. but my lived experience was such that. Um, you know, I was playing, I was engaging in sports and interfaith dialogue uh, with people from different religious traditions, but even in, in terms of my uh, engagement within the Muslim Students Association, um, as, a, as a vice president and later on as a president, I was keenly aware of the diversity of Muslims who were coming to the um, 
uh, we had a little prayer for a masjid within our university. So we would organize the, the Friday prayers um, uh, and then sometimes also the halakas, the circles, learning circles. And I, I just, what, what kind of came to my notice in particular was this diversity um, of not just Muslim people that were coming from various backgrounds, maybe Arab, Arab, Southeast Asian or South Asian. What I found intriguingly uh, fascinating was the fact that all of them had very different understandings of Islam, mm. including my own. So I was asking myself, how can I make sense of this diversity? Where, where does this uh, diversity, intellectual diversity about interpreting Islam come from, not just in terms of the lived experience and people coming, you know, Muslim people coming from various cultures. I, I was also interested in that, of course. But my my primary my primary um, question that I wanted to answer to my, to myself was how to make sense of this intellectual diversity and differences in interpretation of the Islamic canonical texts, which eventually led me into to to. To, to write a PhD uh, on, on this topic. In the meantime, I also uh, became aware of the progressive Muslim community movement in the United States. Mm. At the time, there was a, a website called Muslims Wake Up, which was set up by progressive Muslim-minded people. And um, a book was published in 2003, uh, edited by Professor Mitsapi that also played an important, um, um, it had an inf kind of a formative influence on, on my thinking. I found myself really at home with that book and um, I connected with some progressive Muslim-minded scholars in the United States um, and started to contribute to, um, to, the, to contemporary discussions on various aspects of Islam. I also connected with some people from Pakistan, Al Maurid Institute. Mm. Um, uh, they were one of the few groups that, in um, as early as late 1990s, really took advantage of the internet to to um, proliferate uh, the ideas and to you know to engage with the online Muslim community globally. So I learned a lot from them, especially in relation to this concept of Sunnah and how how to think about the concept of Sunnah. Uh, in contradistinction with this concept of a sahih hadith. So that led me, one of my earliest writings were actually on this topic of evolution of the concept of sunnah um, chronologically. And, um, and yeah, so I had an interest in sunnah and hadith studies, but for my PhD, so I wrote an honors thesis on the on the on the, on the evolution of the concept of Sunnah. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after that, I realized that yeah, Sunnah, the way we think about the concept of Sunnah plays an integral part in trying to understand these differences in interpretation. Mm -hmm. But I I realized as I was researching more and more that there is more to it than just the concept of Sunnah. There are additional uh, considerations, additional factors, processes, mechanisms, interpretational um, assumptions that lead to differences in interpretation. So um, that's how, uh, so I settled finally on this idea of comparing uh, interpretational assumptions and models that govern progressive Muslims and what I call near traditional Salati or, or Salati uh, interpretations of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Islamic intellectual tradition more generally. And that 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 and how these differences in the interpretational methodology result in very different constructions or conceptualizations of what does it mean to be uh, an ideal believer and an ideal Muslim woman. So uh, I kind of try to compare, contrast, why is it that these two contemporary Islamic movements, progressive Muslims and neo-traditional Salafis, although they engage with the same text, um, they come out with very, very different understandings of what does it mean to be a religiously ideal Muslim woman, and what does it mean, what, what, what do the Islamic sources tell believers as to what 
uh, how should they kind of, what is the normative behavior and approach, including in terms of the salvific, salvific efficacy mm. of uh, religious traditions other than Islam? What does Islam have say on the religious uh, efficacy of other religious traditions? Is it an inclusivist or approach? Is it uh, in exclusivist? So, um, yeah, that's what I was exploring in my PhD thesis. So it's a kind of a, a conglomerate of many different elements. And uh, um, I was very pleased that um, that that the PhD was published in 2011 in Professor Khalid Abul Fadl's series, mm -hmm. who is one of my gurus. You might have probably heard of him, yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. And so that's kind of in, 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 yeah, that's kind of my journey. And from there on, I didn't really look back. I I tried to continue writing on progressive Islam, um, um, as well as uh, you know, neo traditional Salafism and some other uh, contemporary phenomena that I found of interest to my own personal identity as uh, someone who was trying to make sense of. Uh, the Islamic intellectual tradition. How how should I you know how I, how should I position myself vis-a-vis -vis this tradition, um, and uh, you know try to find those aspects of the Islamic tradition that uh, in the past that made that kind of we could still consider as being valuable and being able to uh, help us understand the contemporary context in which we live and contribute. In uh, ethically, in ethical terms, to the to the well-being of of um, the world community, and how to how to project a more cosmopolitan and humanistic uh, understanding of the Islamic uh, tradition. Very interesting journey, um, especially the point, the fact that you totally forego uh, traditional understanding. Which, um, which my next question I was going to ask at any point in your being interested in the religion of Islam, did you ever hold any of the views uh, by which you find abhorrent, just based on your writings, not that you find the people, but just, just the views, uh, you don't, find, don't think of them too highly. Have you ever uh, at any time had, you, which you've clearly explained, you've never had any Salafic or fundamentalist uh, views, not even on a scriptural reasoning level, which I find to be very interesting, because even some people, um, even when they come from a, a culturally Muslim background and they turn towards religion at some point, uh, they they tend to go with what one person told me, the mosque culture, which which tends to be very Salafi, um, and then they transition out of it. But, you know, it seems like you have the wisdom or the uh, maturity to kind of forego that aspect of it and really see value in um, an, an academic uh, understanding of how uh, Islamic history and, and um, theology is 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 uh, told. Yes, I mean that's one way of putting it. Um, yeah, I, I think the fact that I had recourse to academic literature as I was studying really played an important role, and that I was very much impressed with scholars such as Fazul Rahman, and then later on in my journey as I was studying uh, progressive Muslim-minded thinkers like Ibrahim Musa, I reached out to him and you know, asked him uh, you know, for some advice how to go about understanding the Islamic tradition. So uh, also I, I came across the writings of, of, of Professor Khaled Abul Fadl, especially his book the conference of the books, the search for beauty in Islam. Mm. So that also had a very important uh, influence on my thinking. So yeah, as you said, I was very fortunate enough to to surround myself with the ideas of scholars that I just mentioned and similar scholars, and. Um, and once once you have tasted the sweetness of uh, of that kind of Islam, it's <laughs> um, uh, you know uh, these other ideas become less plausible and less appealing. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I'm oh, sorry. Uh... No, no. That's that's all I had to say. Okay. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, one of the reasons why progressive Islam is often mischaracterized and misunderstood starts with the name itself. 
Um, I'm not saying that in order to get wrapped up in semantics, but for those who do have some reservations about that particular title or are completely unfamiliar with the appellation, progressive Islam, uh, what are some other terms that could be used to describe this particular way of viewing and understanding the Islamic tradition? Yeah, I get that a lot. Uh, that's a really wonderful question. And I appreciate that the word progressive is far from ideal. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we do need to uh, use some kind of an adjective, some kind of a label. Otherwise, other people will label us <laughs> and they will be probably less generous. Uh, but I, I, because I mentioned that book edited by Professor Amit Sati and had the word progressive uh, Muslims in it. And because I very much felt that I wanted to contribute intellectually to continue with these kinds of ideas, it was my anchoring point. So I felt that my, what I was writing about uh, very much uh, cohered with and was in synchrony uh, and it, it kind of was a continuation of the ideas that were explored in that book and some other similar books. So I decided to continue using that term. Mm. Alternative terminology, like Professor Ibrahim Musa uses the word critical traditionalism as the equivalent of or progressive Islam or progressive Muslims. I would use the words such as cosmopolitan Islam or humanistic Islam um, as alternatives that reflect uh, the worldview and the philosophy behind progressive Muslim thought. Um, but the, yeah, so the word progressive, if, if for you know, for people, if people do go and look at some of my writings, they will see that I have try to explain exactly why and, and justify my choice of the word. Mm. Uh, so the word progressive, essentially, many of the aspects of progressive Muslim thought that I've theorized in two of my books, essentially are a response to or a co correction uh, or a... Um, um, I guess a response to would be the most gener most generous way of describing it to that predominant Islamic orthodoxy. So uh, and it um, so often the the issues that I had to deal with, and and the way I framed the questions were done in such a manner to expose what a progressive Muslim thought considers to be the inadequacies or mm -hmm. problematic nature of Islamic orthodoxy. So in, in relation to the word progressive here, it, it refers to the idea of possibility of, not inevitability of change, but possibility of change, including in terms of how we conceptualize our ethics, how we conceptualize God. So the idea that the meaning, the, 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 the possibilities of what Islam could mean have not been exhausted in the past. Mm. Yeah. So that it is possible to develop novel, creative, and potentially more ethical understandings of the Islamic tradition compared to what was in the past. So it's it. So because classical mainstream orthodoxy invests very heavily in this idea that the that the pinnacle or the apex of um, um, of Islamic piety and and scholarly endeavor resides in the past. Yeah. Or as you characterize, and authenticity, which I really like the way authenticity. authenticity resides yeah. in the past. Exactly. So this has certain very, very important uh, consequences, epistemologically speaking, ethically speaking. Uh, so if our authenticity is always uh, located in the past and we have a and uh, our way of being able to uh, access that authenticity is through a heavily textualist scriptural reasoning hermeneutic, then it precludes us from being able to generate ethical uh, knowledge or new sources of knowledge that um, are sensitive to the evolution of morality and thinking that has happened in the intervening period at a global level. Mm 
Definitely. So, it, because it puts it us could, at conflict with the present as well as with the future by only trying to idealize the past, which... Um, indeed, and it also does a disservice to the Islamic intellectual tradition in a sense that it considers it as, as something that develops in a closed system and that it has not been influenced by any outside factors or that it hasn't influenced any outside um, uh, sources of knowledge. So it's it's this idea of of a closed system that uh, essentially is not able to update itself uh, and it also implies this idea that um, any sources of knowledge or any any construction of new knowledge, any new discourses that humanity at large uh, has brought about could never be integrated or considered part of the Islamic tradition itself. And this is, I think, something that even goes against Islamic history itself because uh, classical Islam uh, was in many ways an outcome of external influences of Greek, Greek and Roman and 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 you know uh, philosophies and and, and 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 ideas so islam islamic tradition has never been completely shut off and closed off and to insist on that i think it does a disservice to the islamic tradition itself and it needlessly it needlessly closes it off um and uh and especially to people you. who want to be a part of the wider world, who who want to mm -hmm. be a Muslim, uh, be religious, and still want to engage in the discourse of uh, today in order to you know come up with solutions or or influence uh, certain ideas. So um, I one hundred percent agree with you on on that. That was excellent how you um, explained. Yeah. It. it also presupposes it presupposes that the Quran itself is not open to. To new knowledge that, that the concept of sunnah itself is a static concept that it that doesn't allow for evolution it doesn't allow for progression in terms of ethics and none of these are actually true upon a closer look at um, the quran as a uh, if you look at the quran contextually if you look at the quran um, through a thematic holistic kind of lens i think it could be argued easily that the Quran, Quran's approach to knowledge is very much premised upon the idea of being open mm. rather than being foreclosed. Uh, obviously, making generalizations about the Quran is always dangerous because the Quran is a composition of different discourses and we can talk about this later on mm. but a contextualist and a holistic kind of uh, thematic holistic approach to the quran i think to an objective observer uh, uh, would suggest strongly that um, quran does not preclude its audience or those who believe in its message to shut themselves off no, from from knowledge and uh and from a potentially, I mean, uh, Professor Amina Wadud has talked about this a lot in the context of uh, gender issues, this idea of a moral trajectory uh, that we find in the Quran uh, that, that we could use to extrapolate this idea that um, ethical perfection was not realized in the past and it's never gonna be realized and that there's always room for, for you know, human beings uh, to become better, to, to for the ethical moral compasses to be even more attuned, and the way they even conceptualize God. None of these things can be said to be exhausted in the past, and that there is a possibility of, and not only a possibility, and I think a responsibility for every generation of Muslims to, in, to, to, to ask these questions uh, within their own context, within their own positioning, within their own demands and imperatives of the time and the context in which they live. Okay. Um, you know, I also believe that one of the hardest obstacles for people to get over uh, is to not see progressive Islamic thought 
aka critical traditionalism as some weird aberration having originated from outside of an Islamic framework. Uh, but concerning your view of progressive Islam, you believe that as a mode of thinking, it represents and is a continuation of Islam during its most formative period, uh, but at the same time, in some ways different. So for those who might not see the genealogy between what appears to be two very disconnected periods of time, can you please explain how you believe these two points of reference, uh, progressive Islam and early Islam, are uh, interrelate? And then can you explain what sets them apart in their approach? All right, so it's a very complicated question, but let's okay, start sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, let's start by acknowledging something first. And this is what the Islamic, the classical Islamic paradigm itself accepts the idea that Islamic orthodoxy, in, in the sense of the former Dahib and the three theological schools, was an elongated, hundreds and hundreds of years long process that went through its ups and downs. So when we talk about classical taqlid based Islam uh, of the of the former Zahib, let's let's leave it in the context of Sunni tradition first. Of all. When we think of the four core orthodoxies in terms of legal thought uh, and in and the three theological schools, uh, the, the Ashari, the Maturidi, and the Salafi or Athari, uh, this construct, and it is very much a construct, uh, reached its maturity, or uh, let's see, uh, this, this paradigm became only a, a serious proposition at the end of the fifth century of mm -hmm. the Islamic calendar. Uh, really, that late? So this is what the tradition itself would uh, no, have no qualms in, in admitting. So the argument here is then, then by by implication, what was pre, well, no these first four even four four hundred years, if, uh, there were different types of Islam that died out for various reasons. Often these reasons were not because alternative forms of Islam had more intellectual force or were more convincing on intellectual grounds. It had to do with patronage politics. And you know to what extent certain scholars had were able to attract and retain students. So lots of lots of mundane, uh, accidental historical, if I could call, or content contingent factors that have led to to the formation of, of, of orthodoxy. Some you know at the time of someone like Abu Hamid al Ghazali. So and if we, I mean, to the extent that we know early Islam. We uh, many scholars have made an argument that some of that uh, you know even the, the, the even the, the Orthodox tradition itself talks about you know many that there were 30, 40, 50 different uh, you know madhahib in the past and in other words the the, the diversity of Islamic thought uh, was much greater than what it came to be later on especially during the first hundred and fifty to two hundred years. And, and I, you know, I noticed that even within the same sect, depending on the geography, you will see vastly uh, different opinions. When I was looking into the Ibadi school, um, mm -hmm. I, I noticed that depending on if they were in Kufa, if they were in Baghdad, if they were in Arabia, or if they were in uh, the Maghrib. So, uh, yeah, you're spot Excellent on. Excellent point. Yeah, excellent point. That's why we, for example, we talk about early Hanafism, classical Hanafism, post-classical Hanafism. Or even the way they, like even within one school of thought, like uh, and when I edited the book on the concept of Sunnah, this became really clear. And I had a contribution from Professor... Um, uh, Ursula uh, Francesca. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think you interviewed her by my... You know, I, I, I was recommended, I yeah. reached out to Abdul Rahman Al Salami for an interview and he had recommended her and I just haven't uh, yet, but I'm very much familiar with uh, uh, you did this, uh, interview someone on, uh, on the Daribadi school. Of uh, yeah, Valerie Hoffman. Valerie Hoffman, yeah. So even even within, even in relation to one concept, such as the concept of Sunnah, we see differences within one school of thought, quite, quite distinct differences. As in relation to concept of Sunnah in particular, we see a large discrepancy uh, pre Shafi'i and post Shafi'i, where, uh, where this concept of Sunnah in pre Shafi'i uh, 
Islam was much more dynamic, much more linked to kind of um, a communitarian understanding, uh, not linked necessarily to Prophet Muhammad, uh, and it 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 could evolve, it could it could uh, it could uh, absorb, let's say, new ideas. So this the idea that the that this, the the antonym of the concept of Sunnah is. Um, uh, like uh, innovation, that's not really true. That's a secondary development. Hmm. Uh, the idea that, and even the word bid'ah itself in the, uh, in early Islam didn't mean the antonym of sunnah. So right. we could actually check all of these developments. So my argument here being is that uh, as we are talking about Islamic orthodoxy uh, and and like uh, what was happening prior to that, we definitely had um, much more diversity uh, intellectually speaking. And some of the strands, and this is well documented, some of the strands were much more contextualist in their approach to the Quran. They, they were much more rationalist in their approach to the Quran and the tradition. Some of them were very skeptical uh, to the extent that they uh, doubted the very ontological uh, character of the Quran itself, not to mention the Hadith tradition. So we had some free think uh, thinkers in the past who were very skeptical of, of Quran's claims, ontological claims, but yet still considered themselves to be Muslims. Right. Yeah, I think Abu Bakr al Razi. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I'd be one of them. And Ma'ari. Ma and, but, but, but they, you see, they, the concept, and this is something that uh, progressive Islam also is a continuation of. And this, this is very difficult for people to understand, especially those who come from a more fundamentalist or traditionalist mindset. They have invested in the, very heavily in this idea that the Quran is the A all and the B all of everything, mm. uh, the theologically speaking, and, and not just theologically speaking, but then it pours into the the, uh, the legal issues, ethical issues. They have a, what I call a very maximalist and approach to the Quran, whereas you know we had discussions in the Islamic knowledge and history of uh, you know when 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 there was no Sharia revealed from God. Was it still was it still possible for people to believe in God and be uh, you know upright believers in God? And many scholars have argued that this was the case. So what what distinguishes? Or, uh, if you don't mind, professor, if I ask the question, I, I often thought about it when I looked into the Morisco situation and how they had to forego so many of their practices. Would that still be considered an authentic version of Islam? Uh, the Moriscos in um, uh, 15th, 16th century Spain, where they couldn't practice outright and they had to hide. Uh, where they were only left to belief and whatever they could do, given their situation. I often ask myself, would Muslims see that yeah. as an authentic expression? Yeah, the, the, yeah. I guess you, you can frame, I can frame my answer in relation to this question uh, by presupposing that Islamic orthodoxy and its orthopraxis is still valid and should be kind of part of monormative Islam. Let's mm -hmm. assume that is the case. Like even like we see the contemporary a re, uh, kind of uh, re-manifestation of, of that kind of situation as, among Muslims in the West. And though this whole idea of fiqh al and and fiqh uh, fiqh uh, the, the, uh, are all premised upon this idea that if Muslims live in a minority and they are, you know, that, that, that they live in a context that is very challenging, then there are certain uh, mechanisms within the Islamic tradition that allow them to be much more flexible in terms of the um, practice of their faith. But this, this still assumes that Islamic orthodoxy and the normative parameters of Islamic orthodoxy are indeed normative. Whereas for progressive Muslim thought, for example, um, we do not, the, the yardstick that we use in relation to what is normative Islam is not, no, is not Islamic orthodoxy itself, because we realize that Islamic orthodoxy is a byproduct of, as I mentioned earlier on. So that's not the measuring stick positive. by which yeah. progressive, so or, Islam orthodoxy is not the measuring stick by which progressive Islam measure, compares itself to. No, no, it is more of the rationalist and contextualist minded scholars uh, who had a much more, let's say, uh, uh, historical, uh, much more um, um, the concept of revelation was not based on the concept of scripture, mm. uh, but uh, that, that it's much more broad. So what constitutes revelation, for example, 
uh, could be the, the human religious experience itself or, or the external world. All of these are, as the Quran would say, ayatullah. Yeah, they are, even the Quran confirms this, but progressive Islam does not use the Quran to uh, as, as an a priori kind of argument uh, because the philosophy that <laughs> that underpins progress in terms of the philosophy of religion that underpins progressive Islam, it is not based on, um, so ontologically, or let's say theologically, scripture is secondary mm. to, to uh, not primary in terms of questions of what is the nature of God? How do we understand God's will? Or where do we find, you know, so all of these questions um, that can be explored through a scriptural hermeneutic uh, are, first explored within a philosophical mindset and uh, and then uh, only those ideas that you find that we find in scriptures that resonate with uh, already established philosophy and worldview mm -hmm. then uh, um, then so it's not the other way around so in, in fundamentalist and traditional thought they believe that their views are based on scripture which is also problematic because uh, uh, one's understanding of scripture is um, conditioned by so many oh, meta, yeah. textual, and textual factors. So there's no such thing as a presuppositionless understanding of scripture. So because progressive Islam, as I said, and here is the link between like uh, the, the pan-entheistic pan kind of philosophical Sufism of Ibn al-Arabi, for example, comes into play. Because see the Quran, if we are if we are really honest, the Quran doesn't really provide any conceptual knowledge. Quran does not provide us with conceptual knowledge. It does not define any concepts or ideas in a in a in a philosophical or, or, or manner, or even in terms of systematic theology. Yeah, it almost so, speaks to us as if we understand on so many different levels. It speaks to us as if we understand what's going on uh, concerning what it's conveying to us. Uh, to where it only yeah, goes into doesn't go into detail exactly and we in, in scholarship this is termed dialogical dialectical and discursive nature of the quran mm. um uh the quran presupposes many many things and actually that, that gives us a strong hint in terms of its own emergence and we can talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about late antiquity and the intertextuality of the quran but for the purposes of answering your question progressive muslim thought and it's pre-modern antecedents always exist there were those approaches like let's call them quasi philosophical sufism that did you did make use of scripture but understood the the limits that scripture can provide to us in terms of not only understanding god intellectually and philosoph philosophically but also trying to understand god god uh, uh, um, through a scripture in terms of our own mystical and subjective religious experience all right so in it to, to to kind of simplify what i just said progressive islam in terms of its pre-modern antecedents would be found in as i said schools of philosophical sufism like ibn al-arabi or rationalist scholars like 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 certain mu'tazila who argued that god has to you know that we it is not <laughs> who who argue that for something to be conceptualized as God, it needs to uh, and to be true to the divinity of God, it needs to uh, meet certain criteria in terms of um, what kind of attributes and what kind of will it possesses. So if, if a God requires of me to do something that is ethically immoral or abhorrent or ugly, then that lit, litmus test will tell me that that is not really God that demands this because mm -hmm. God also has to abide by certain ethical, ethical standards. So if God is demanding uh, sacrifice of a son or some kind of uh, uh, ethically problematic, ugly practice, then we could argue that this, this element in the scripture possibly has um, provenance, historical provenance, or it, it is part of um, 
uh, an existing historical religious tradition that came out of a, a different understanding of God that, that did not have those ethical safeguards put in place and therefore it's rejected. So mm. in progressive Islam, and this is very difficult for people to accept because they people many people who come in, into to religion and to Islam and not just Islam, but generally speaking, they want something that will provide, you know, something that is purely divine, that will give them all the answers uh, in an unproblematic manner, and something that will uh, be emblematic of, of, of true, unaltered, uh, un, unchanged, and pure word of God that has no kind of uh, historical dimension to it. And simply that is in pro from the perspective of progressive Islam and process relational thought, that's a metaphysical impossibility. Yeah. There is, yeah. So I hope that makes the, my, my answer to that question a little bit more clear. So there is the element of rational contextualist thought and element of mystical philosoph philosophical thought that we find uh, and kind of radical free thinking that we find in, in pre-modern uh, streams of Islam. And, and we progressive Islam tries to amplify them and tries to um, articulate them in our contemporary epistemological and world kind of uh, uh, context and late modernity context. Very interesting. I, I see how you make the correlation between progressive Islam and the modes of thinking that were current in early Islam, and then how uh, after a period of time, maybe after the first four centuries, there started to become a, a, a closing of uh, understanding the religion or, or how much we want to take from elsewhere to understand the religion. Um, and I, you mentioned a lot about the Sunnah, the Quran, late antiquity. Uh, did you want to add something uh, to that, Professor? Yeah. Yeah. So in my 2011 book, uh, when I was comparing, you know, like the, the, that book that came out of my PhD thesis was all about comparing the interpretational uh, assumptions and models that govern progressive Muslim and near traditional Salafi thought. And one of them was the nature of, of revelation and the concept of the Quran itself. And here in 2011, I already made reference to uh, the so-called Egyptian literary uh, approach to the Quran, people like Amin al-Khuli, who was the teacher of, of Nasser Abu Zaid. Uh, there was already a school of thought in early 20th century that took this idea that the Quran is a literary composition, a text that is comes from a certain, certain social cultural context very seriously. And they, they were interpreting the Quran from that perspective. And this got Professor Nasser Abu Zaid into trouble later on. And he was- yeah, There was another Egyptian yeah. thinker, uh, yeah. Ahmed Muhammad. I, sometimes I get these names mixed up. Ahmed Muhammad yeah, yeah, Alafala yeah. um, also had uh, came out with something uh, on the literary art of the Quran that got him into a lot of hot water. Um, yeah. But I found what I do know of his book, I have some excerpt, excerpts of it um, over behind me. Um, what I do understand of his uh, dissertation is that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my turn. What I do understand of his dissertation was that uh, he, he was saying that there's a certain style, uh, a certain style that the Quran tells the stories in, and it's not meant to be historical, but it's meant to be a, a literary, um, a literary art, or we should see it as literary art that appeal to the uh, sensibilities of the first audience of the Quran. And, you know, which had me thinking that if it was to be revealed in our time, maybe the stories would be a little bit different, you know, um, mm -hmm. not to mix Revelation with uh, Marvel Comics or something, but, you know, yeah. maybe it would be something like X-Men uh, stories being told because, you know, Marvel has become very popular even amongst adults. Uh, sure, and, that's, that's a good thing. analogy. That, that, that's a good analogy. And um, not only that, like in my 2011 book, I also look at uh, uh, what we call European romantic, um, European romanticism. They've, um, they, for example, they, the, in the Christian context, they've emphasized this idea of, of, of the, um, uh, let's say, uh, historicity of revelation what we call a, an anthropological turn in, in, in theology. Mm. And, and in, in Christianity in the 18th and the 19th, even earlier than that, of course, it later developed into you know, forms of biblical, textual, historical criticism. So the antecedents can be found 
uh, in, in European romantic thinking that approach the scripture in a, in a much more humane and from an anthropological rather than a theological kind of perspective lens, interpretational lens. But if we look at um, also, for example, uh, the, the more intellectual form of Sufism, like Ibn al-Arabi and people within his school of thought, they've often been quite, often quite audacious in terms of the way they talk about, uh, and Professor Abdul Karim Sarouj has talked about this at length, about how even the prophetic experience of the divine, and, and also a scholar called Shabestari in Iran, they talk about the contingency and the evolution of even prophetic experience and the entire edifice of Sufism uh, that, you know, the, 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 all the, the Sufi, the Sufi um, masters um, and the Sufi tradition is based upon this idea of inheriting the charisma, the, the prophetic charisma of the prophet so, and, and kind of adding to it, um, making it evolve, implying that it even it the prophetic experience of the divine is also contingent and embedded in historical um, conditions. Mm. So we see, so prof uh, progressive Islam takes this uh, streak, uh, uh, this idea or this line, line of thought also very seriously, that um, the, the idea of prophetic consciousness uh, itself has to be uh, is in is is itself conditioned mm -hmm. by, by uh, regardless uh, you know whether what whether or not we accept that it is divinely inspired. This is of course a faith based assumption, but that it cannot operate at a meta historical level in the sense that even itself is it it, it itself the prophetic consciousness is at what at least at one level. Uh, contingent and and conditioned by by the historical circumstances, and we see this very clearly in the Quran. Uh, the, the thing is, the the orthodox paradigm has invested very heavily for certain reasons in this idea of of the ijaz of Quran, and uh, the in inimitability, and any. Um, so it is a construct that uh, this idea that you know the, the 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 Islamic orthodoxy's approach to the Quran itself is a construct. It's 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 uh, uh, the arguments took hundreds of years to develop. Mm. So it's not something that um, uh, one has to take on its face value. Uh, so um, so yeah. So this idea that um, the Quran. Uh, has a real historical dimension to it and that it's when we look at the nature of the, the Quran and its discourse it is strongly pointing it is strongly pointing to, uh, to a particular um, time period to a particular uh, community of listeners it assumes a lot uh, uh, actually it assumes a uh, a lot in terms of the biblical knowledge that one would require or need to have in order to understand many Quranic passages, suggesting that the emergence of the Quranic composition or set of discourses uh, was very much in, uh, intimately linked to certain uh, debates and certain uh, uh, even sectarian <laughs> Uh, in, in, in relation to the Judeo-Christian tradition, I, I mean, that, that it, it was intimately engaged in these debates and rebuttals and theological uh, conundrums that that were that were preoccupying the minds of of people in that region in at that time. Uh, so, I mean, definitely that that's what made late. That's what makes the time period of late antiquity so appealing because. Um, in Quranic exegesis or in exegesis on the Quran that came after the Quran was revealed, you know, don't really tap into what was going on uh, at the time the Quran was being revealed or the time period before. And only when you see late antiquity, do you are you able to kind of interpret the Quran within that historical uh, within the historical framework that it was revealed in. So uh, you're 100 percent right. Yeah. about. This. Yeah, I mean, there is a. Uh, uh... 
undeniably, now over the last decade, there has been, to my mind, uh, to my mind, some extremely convincing scholarship on this, on, uh, on, on, on how it makes much more sense to understand the emergence of the Quran and the early Islam itself as, as being intimately linked to, to late antiquity, Middle East, and to, you know, certain, and this is reflected in the Quran, a, a kind of, a, 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 let's say, a, a, if, you, if you were to give the Quran to some, one person who's never heard of the text or what it is, and, and simply on the basis of its content and the nature in which the Quran is written, and the, 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 its form and its style, it strongly points to what the late antiquity scholars uh, have been trying to tell us uh, in terms of now. Some people might find that, or might say, well, how can you still be a Muslim if you, if you have this kind of approach to the Quran? Yeah, well, you know, to some extent, that's a fair question. You cannot really, if you want to be part, of, if you want to consider yourself as part of the Islamic orthodoxy, which itself is a construct as we talked about previously, then it's, impo that it's impossible really to, to reconcile these two ideas. Although we find in, in tafsir, as you said, and, and uh, often uh, the they couldn't understand certain words in the Quran, they didn't know the historical context, and they were doing a lot of guesswork, and, and they admitted that many, many words in the Quran had Aramaic, yeah. even Ethiopic or Hebrew origin or, or Persian origin. Al so being one of them. Yeah. yeah so we, we find these we find these discussions yet uh, because they were in, invested in this idea of the Quran's utter transcendent nature and kind of uh, they were not able to kind of concomitantly also develop this argument further. But if we do not adhere to Islamic orthodoxy and, and believe that revelation is not necessarily depend upon, uh, dependent upon scripture and that uh, our philosophy of religion, our concept of God uh, also does not necessarily depend upon scripture and even scripture doesn't really reveal, pardon me, does not really, uh, and the history of religious thought, give, I mean, informs us that this is true, not just in relation to Islam, but any religious tradition. The fact that Christians have fought over what is the nature of God and they, they understood God very differently, even though they were all kind of saw themselves within the tradition of Christianity, they had very different concepts and understandings of God. Even within Islam, you know, some people uh, were very comfortable with a panentheistic kind of concept of God, whereas others would recoil and you know only adhere to a classical theist conception of God, concept of God. Yet both of themselves, both of them view themselves and were seen as part of the same religious tradition. Mm. So um, the, the, what I'm trying to say is that scripture does not resolve the question of the concept of God, the nature of God, not even the concept of belief and doctrine. You cannot simply derive it mechanistically out of scripture and say this is 100% scriptural and there is no subjectivities coming from anywhere else. So yeah, so it is still possible to uh, consider oneself to be, be to belong to the Islamic intellectual tradition, even if one adopts the view that the Quran has a real historical um, element that it is an in you know, it is a it's a composition of texts that emerged intra in, intertextually in a particular milieu, uh, uh, but still be able to argue that you know the subsequent tradition, the inter subsequent intellectual tradition that that recognized the Quran as as um, a revelation in whatever sense we want to use that word. Mm. Uh, was able to develop in certain uh, ways that are 
sim that exist in, 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 in affinity with the kind of Islam that I have been trying to describe uh, in relation to progressive Muslim thought. I don't know if that makes sense. No, 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 it does make sense. Yeah. And, and uh, that actually go leads to my next question uh, before actually going into uh, the meat and potatoes of the conversation, which is the uh, your work on the Sunnah and the Quran, which uh, you, you've written extensively and, and you're working on the Sunnah is phenomenal and, and very much thought provoking and I can't wait to speak about it. But I do have one question uh, that um, I found very interesting while I was reading uh, your book, The Imperatives of Progressive Islam, uh, pertaining to how you divide divided contemporary Muslim thought, uh, where you have it split in a tripartite fashion uh, with dogmatic traditionalism as one strand, of course. Uh, but the surprising part about it uh, was your division between progressive Islam and Islamic modernism. Uh, before having uh, read your work, I was under the assumption that Islamic modernism and progressive Islam were more or less synonymous with each other. And actually, it was the other day on Facebook that I heard somebody call someone a progressive modernist Muslim. And, uh, you know, I, I had to think about it and I kind of, I don't want to say corrected them, but I put forth the idea that, you know, I don't think um, Islamic modernism and progressive Islam uh, sees themselves within the same camp. Um, but, you know, it's no mystery how progressive Islamic thinkers feel about dogmatic traditionalists. Uh, but from what I was reading in your book, uh, the progressive Islam also uh, sees Islamic modernists as having their own fair share of shortcomings. Um, so yeah. if you don't mind just uh, explaining uh, how progressive Islam positions itself uh, opposite of Islamic modernism, and what were some of the shortcomings uh, Islamic modernists uh, inherited uh, for, for progressive Muslims or progressive Islamic thinkers to uh, be aware of so they don't fall into the same trap? Yeah, excellent question. And you, you have noted this really well. And thank you so much for uh, engaging with my work um, um, so deeply. Um, to be welcome. fair, you know, yeah, and it, it was. Like, a, I enjoyed it. It was a pleasure yeah, to do so. So, yeah. uh, in many ways, uh, progressive Muslim thought um, is a late twentieth, early twenty first century phenomenon. Yeah, and and its forerunners, as I explained in both my first book and this, in more detail, my first book on progressive Islam that I was comparing with neo traditional Salafism. In many ways, and in some ways, uh, the modernism of the 19th, 18th, 19th, 20th century uh, was a forerunner of progressive Muslim thought. But um, obviously, they, were, they, they, they lived in a radically different context. And they were they very much bought into this idea that uh, you know, kind of the enlightenment ideas of universal values that have no contextualist kind of uh, flavor to them, that, that there is one uniform reason that uh, operates across different contextual realities. And mm -hmm. so, and, and, and they were, they were enamored by this, they, they were, fell in love with the scientific development of, of that was happening in the West. And they felt that you know, if, 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 if the Muslim world was to progress, they would need to um, kind of more or less in total, totally copy the experience of the West. Yeah. Um, having said that, they were also, they didn't really have a, a highly systematic uh, interpretational methodological framework. They were isolated intellectuals operating in certain contexts. Um, and, and they were like more, they were they were reacting to the cultural shock that the Muslim world was experiencing as a result of modernity being imposed upon them and the Muslim uh, and the, the Muslim societies. And they were not willing to, for example, rethink some very fundamental uh doctrines and 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 um inherited ways of thinking especially for example in relation to soul of fiqh mm -hmm. uh, they were not willing to deviate or or they were, and, uh, from it or and um and it was a much more kind of an eclectic intellectually eclectic movement uh that didn't really have 
serious repercussions. It didn't permeate into the society. And as I said, it didn't really also engage with modern sources of knowledge when it comes to philosophy, uh, philosophy of religion, epistemology, uh, you know, feminist theology, and, and like all these, all, although at the time, of course, the feminist theology was not really uh, 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 present, but what I'm trying to say is um, they didn't have a very systematic and robust um, intellectual, it was a, not a very robust and systematic intellectual movement that that was able to really thoroughly critically engage with the Islamic intellectual tradition. So it, it kind of eclectically, so one good example that uh, we, we give is uh, that one way these modernists were trying to reconcile the Islamic tradition with the Western tradition is by not, uh, by engaging in something called talfiq, or like choosing bits and pieces from, uh, let's say, Hanafi thoughts and Maliki thought, and to and picking from here, from here and there, eclectically try to 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 plug in all these holes in order to, to try to uh, progress further and try to solve certain mm -hmm. uh, social and ethical uh, issues that were that they were faced with, but they never really. Uh, were able to both critically engage with enlightenment thought as well as critically engage with the classical Islamic tradition and come up with a systematic philosophy, if you like, that would enable them to radically rethink aspects of the Islamic uh, heritage that were actually causing the problem in the first place. Mm. Whereas progressive Muslim thought, of course, has the advantage of the hundred year intervening years. But as, as I as I talk in my books, progressive Islam is based on something called the, a weak form of postmodern thought, a weak, weak postmodernism. Uh, uh, and I use the work the work of Professor Sheila Ben Habib. I don't know if you know her, she's a political uh, theorist at Yale University. Uh, this has to do with the with the debates between proponents of modernity and postmodernity, and where is the divide, and you know, so it's a complicated series of debates. But essentially, progressive Muslim thought, as I as I tried to convey previously, seriously um, engages with modern sources of knowledge. It critically engages both with modernity as well as the Islamic intellectual tradition. And it sees the value of deconstructionism that we find in postmodern thought, but it goes beyond simply deconstructing and also reconstructs as a result of that deconstruction. Whereas strong forms of postmodern thought, with like Derrida, the, the, they are much more interested in deconstruction rather than reconstructing after deconstruction, whereas progressive Muslim thought uses the tools of deconstruction, deconstructivism, but it is not as, uh, let's say, it is not as pessimistic about the, the value of reason and rationality, because postmodernism is based upon this idea that reason, rationality is so compromised, it's so embedded contextually that it, can, it has no use. Mm. It cannot be transferred from one context into another context. So progressive Muslim thought, I think, uh, has found the right balance between the, the this universal um, objective reason of enlightenment and this very pessimistic view of reason and ethics and ethical relativism that we find in, in strong forms of postmodern thought. And so Professor, I do have... I do have a question since you mentioned uh, how uh, de deconstructionalist uh, ideas or how uh, the period we're living in, a lot of things are being deconstructed, especially within the university when it comes to uh, it, it, Muslim history, Islamic history, as Yasser Qadi um, mentioned as he was going into Yale, uh, that you know what he learned in seminary is totally different than what he learned in Yale. In seminary, they, they construct a house for you. 
Whereas in at Yale, they deconstruct that house. And not only do they deconstruct it, but they leave you left in the pieces trying to figure out what do you, how do you make sense of all of this? And for Muslims who are interested in say, uh, historical, uh, um, the historical critical method or um, Islamic revisionism, reconceiving Islamic history, however you wanna frame it, um, how, how, what are we supposed to do uh, or how are we supposed to give new meaning to how the House of Islam, uh, its history, theology, jurisprudence has been deconstructed? How are we supposed to construct a new house uh, while we're left in the, or give new meaning to the, the pieces that we're left with after the deconstruction has happened? Because it seems like um, uh, with, with um, I mean, God bless non-Muslim academics for all the work that they've done on, on our tradition, um, but it seems like they're, 100% satisfied with leaving it uh, deconstructed while uh, Muslims are left to wallow in the, the rubble. Yeah, no, that's that's an extremely important question and that I, one that I have been wrestling with also. And this is what I find, again, another strength of progressive Muslim thought is um, we are not just scholars, but we are also, we have a sense of belonging to the tradition. Yeah, so we speak from within uh, it's part of our own uh, identity and sense of belonging. So we try to be both critical and yet do it from a, a place of belonging, from a place of compassion, if you like, mm. from a place of care for the tradition, for the, for, from a place uh, or, that is not simply interested in deconstruction, although it values deconstruction, especially in relation to, let's say, gender issues, with you know deconstructing the patriarchal gaze uh, and the patriarchal intellectual interpretative tradition that has dominated uh, Islamic uh, intellectual tradition for such a long time, so it's it's a it's a labor of love. It's, it it has been really in my case. You know, many people might question my motives. Uh, as to why am I doing this, but I can tell you that it's been always done, it's been a labor of love, it's been done from the place of care and for, and concern and, and, the, uh, and, and the belief that the Islamic tradition is robust enough and rich enough to, to sustain and overcome uh, uh, these, the, 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 the problems that have we've had like any other religious tradition uh, on the way. So um, what I find comforting is this idea that uh, distinction that Professor Abdul Karim Soroush made, he talks about distinction between religion and religious knowledge, or Professor Fazul Rahman talks about normative Islam and historical Islam. Professor Khalid Abu Fadl talks about Sharia as the divine, as a as a divine um, kind of um, um, as as the, as a, as a, as a path to the divine, and as a Sharia as a legal construct. So um, so once we accept that inevitably the human understanding of the divine will inevitably be. Uh, um subjective contingent uh and and tainted by you know inadequacies of of the human condition i find that the thought to be very comforting in a sense that we should never project our own and we should be always uh, humble and uh, enough to admit that uh our own perspective is but a perspective and it's based on, 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 on certain assumptions, certain theories, certain presuppositions that ought never be considered as all exhaustive and never be fully equated with the divine because divine, uh, the, the divine is a non-exhaustible reservoir of beauty, majesty, and goodness. And our attempts at capturing the divine, conceptualizing and understanding of the divine will inevitably fall short. Mm. So I find that I find that thought very comforting. Uh, I don't know about you, because nobody, in, in, in other words, nobody has a monopoly on God. Mm. 
uh, I find I find it I find it very comforting. I, I do find it very comforting um, living in uh, what you were saying. I do find comforting uh, concern, considering the fact that we live in a very pluralistic uh, society now, where people have very many different faiths. Uh, as we talked about, even within the same faith, many different ideas about that faith. And as you and as you pointed out, you know, we, we shouldn't totally equate these beliefs totally to the divine. Uh, they're they're a vehicle that we try to use to understand the divine. But for us to say these beliefs are the divine um, it is definitely uh, reaching, reaching a bit and ma keep maintaining that uh, humble outlook, um, I, I believe would solve a, a lot of the problems across uh, religious communities and, and how they function together, um, that we're all trying to reach the same goal with how we understand uh, the divine. And we might not agree on every single point, yeah. but one thing I can respect is that we're, we're not trying to uh, we don't construct these beliefs in order to fight each other, but as I mentioned, in order to reach a uh, to to reach a certain goal. So yeah, that's why it's you know because religion inevitably becomes institutionalized, and when it becomes institutionalized, it's based upon certain doctrines and dogmas, and that's why it's not a good idea uh, to to mix to to kind of. Uh, <laughs> Um, institutionalize uh, a way of yeah, to institutionalize religion and you have a, like an official state religion because you know we might be Muslims but we have radically different understandings of our faith and, and the nature of God and you know uh, legal aspects of the tradition ethical aspects of tradition and if they are being imposed in the name of certain orthodoxy it just creates a lot of problems yeah um, All right. Uh, yeah. Because you mentioned a lot, and uh, because I read quite a bit of your work for this interview, uh, there's so many, you, you say things and then it sparks so many different ideas or things that I would like to talk about, so I'm trying my hardest to stay on point. And so uh, I do want to go into defining the Sunnah, uh, which is, or uh, your work on the Sunnah, which um, I found to be very interesting and thought provoking. And I actually uh came across something similar to what you were writing while reading Ignaz Goldziher. I'm not sure if it was in his book on the uh Zahirites or was it in Muhammadan Studies uh volume two. Uh but that um the, the Sunnah isn't always uh you don't find the Sunnah in Hadith. Uh not not always or, or in that early period the Sunnah and Hadith weren't um synonymous with each other. Whilst my understanding as uh, growing into be, being or becoming a Muslim and growing in belief, uh, I always thought this, the Hadith was a vehicle for the Sunnah and mm -hmm. that one represented the other and they were totally intertwined. And that's the only way for you to understand the Sunnah is via this textual approach. Uh, but after reading your work, um, and then you have two articles on this one, they both seem to be the same article but one is twice as long as the other one goes into more detail about uh the sunnah and the, how it developed in the first fourth century uh, I'll, I'll link both in the description as well as uh your griffith academia edu page uh so people can um read your writing and I, and I recommend people go into go look at your writings read them uh because we're only uh scratching the surface with this type of uh conversation but um you know, so what did the Sunnah mean as a pre-Quranic term compared to what it meant as a Quranic term versus what it came to mean in post-Quranic usage? Because uh, I believe that that way of looking at it kind of helps people understand uh, how it developed as a concept. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, as you said, it's a, it's a complicated subject matter. Um, like if uh, what you mean by pre-Quranic, you probably mean linguistically. We cannot really probably say with any degree of confidence what Sunnah could have. Met. I mean, if we use like uh, Lisan al Arab or uh, some dictionaries, uh, you know, uh, they they've been compiled much later on. So I I, I probably we, we would I wouldn't be able to I can, I can etymologically linguistically tell you what the concept of Sunnah means outside of the Quran. You know, it has a different meaning. Uh, you know, the idea of a kind of a path or or um, something ethically upright. Yeah, that you know, a person, a certain person, established a certain legacy 
that people consider to be upright and normative and they should follow in it mm. as a result. Quranically, of course, Sunnah has different meanings. It's only used a couple of times and Sunnah al the the the, 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 the the legacy of the people of the past. Or, uh, uh, there's another one I'm trying to remember now. It's been a long time since I've been the, 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 the Sunnah of God. Um, yeah, Sunnatullah, Sunnatullah, yes, or uh, the unchanging laws of God. So the, what's important to emphasize here is that there is no phrase Sunnatul Nabi in the Quran or Sunnatul Rasul. So this is a secondary development that uh, eventuated probably in the first quarter of the second century of Hijri with the Talab al-Ilm and, and the Ulum al-Hadith movement, the, the, the recording time, uh, that's a secondary development. But before we move into, the, into that, it's important to emphasize that uh, what the, the most useful way for me to think about, to, to the way I was thinking about the, the concept of Sunnah when I, because I was very, very interested in, like, as I told you, my first exposure to Islamic studies was through people like Fazul Rahman, who has made important contributions to the understanding of the concept of Sunnah, but also the people in Pakistan from Al Maurid Institute, who whose concept of Sunnah was actually based upon early Hanafi thought, pre-Shafi'i uh, pre Hanafi thought, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that was also non-textualist in, in its nature. It, um, not only was it non-textualist, non, non, uh, non it also um, suggested that its progenitor or that the person who was responsible for instituting a sunnah need not necessarily have been the prophet himself. Mm -hmm. So even if we, in some textualist, early textual sources, we have examples, and I have cited this in the two, those two, two, two different articles, we see examples of the word sunnah being used in conjunction with the entire community. Uh, or, or with certain persons that are not the Prophet himself, like the Sunnah Abu, uh, Abu Bakr or Sunnah Omar or, or uh, 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 Sunnah al marufa al mahfuza the well-known, well preserved Sunnah. So we have all these, so that's why I was so interested to, to get as many instances of the way in which the, the word sunnah was used in, across different uh, disciplines in Islam. And this is, um, I edited a volume on this with, I was very grateful to many scholars working in different genres here who have investigated how the concept of sunnah involved, let's say in the sira or in tarikh or in different schools of thought. In, 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 and we see how, what a rich concept uh, the concept of Sunnah was in early Islam, and it had many different meanings. And only in the second century, in the in the second quarter, towards the second beginning of the second quarter of the second century, so let's say 125 years Hijri, around that time, do we see this narrowing down, or the start of the narrowing down? But it took another century before. Uh, this what I call a hadith dependent concept of Sunnah finally won and, and kind of and it started and it had an highly important uh, it had a significant uh, impact upon the way the Quran was later on interpreted and, and theology and, 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 and ethics and, and morality because it was primarily hadith based. And Al Shafi, so you had, had made, play, sorry, just just yeah. to ask this Al Shafi, question, yeah, played, played a instrumental, major part, but not immediately. It was Muzani and his students who actually mm. uh, contributed towards this this dispersion of and proliferation of these ideas uh, of Shafi. Uh, but it took it took it took good two and a, two and a half centuries. For, for this paradigm of a hadith dependent concept of sunnah to, to uh, significantly shape Islamic uh, thought. Uh, so it is very much a secondary development. It was restricted to the prophet himself and it was given a wholly textualist expression. Mm. Although the concept of a living tradition, uh, sunnah as a living tradition, something that is perpetuated through a living tradition uh, not through texts, of course, still existed, 
that's why, for example, we find many, especially in the Hanafi and to some extent Maliki school of thought, we find remnants of this kind of living tradition based concept of Sunnah, where we had a uh, discrepancy between what the Hadith would say and, and, and that Hadith would be and what people were practicing and what 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 the actual living tradition demanded or, 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 or the expression of it in terms of its living tradition. So, so and Professor Jonathan Brown has written on this um, in his valuable work where he talks about, or, or sorry, what, was it, was it, no, it was the other Daniel Brown, Professor Daniel Brown. He talked about how uh, many of these scholars in classical, like not in the formative period of the method uh, based Islam, but in the classical and post-classical period, they, in theory, they had to assent to the hadith-based concept of sunnah, but they still resisted it in its application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we see these tensions even existing in the post Shafi'i uh, uh, legal thinking in various traditions, to the extent that even within like a Hanafi school of thought, you would have people who are leaning more towards a Shafi concept of Sunnah, but although they still pledge their allegiance to a Hanafi school of thought, mm -hmm. But for all sets of purposes, the way they approached the concept of Sunnah was so distorted or so influenced by a Shafi concept that they actually uh, no longer, uh, their understanding of the concept of Sunnah, uh, although they adhered to a Hanafi madhab, it didn't really reflect the Hanafi, early Hanafi um, concept and approach to, to, uh, to the concept of Sunnah. I hope that makes sense. No, so no, there no, was no. a Shafi'ization, or some people talk about a Salafization of the concept of Sunnah, even in, in, in Hanafism and Maliki school of thought that, historically speaking, were much more successful in resisting uh, the Shafi'i school. Ibadi school, the the Ibadi school as well. Um, yeah, under, the Ibadi school uh, as well. The same thing. Good example. Yeah. So uh, but I do have a question, to... Professor, before I forget. Would the um, Salat, would, learning how to pray, would that be considered a living tradition? Because uh, as you mentioned in one of your publications, I, I, I learned how to pray. Nobody taught me by saying, read this Hadith book, or they gave me a compilation of Hadiths to learn how to do it. I had someone who knew how to do it. They told me what to say. I watched how they move. And I was even told that in the Hadith corpus, you don't find... Uh, how to pray in an A to Z fashion. You you find bits in, in one hadith, yeah. you'll find bits in another hadith, and it's kind of been put together. So uh, so my question is, would, would given that fact about the prayer, it's not line laid out in a single hadith, uh, and that we practice visually with someone showing us, would, would, that, would the prayer be considered a, a living tradition? Yeah. I, something based on text. Yeah, I'm sympathetic and have been sympathetic to that view. Um, however, there are certain caveats that this presupposes, for example, that there has always been a normative model that had to be adhered to. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And that the living tradition was robust enough not to succumb to certain alterations. Mm -hmm. And now, given the inter intertextuality of the Quran and in the light of the more recent critical historical scholarship, I have lost lost quite uh, I have lost quite a bit of confidence. I must say, in this idea that the living tradition was strong enough not to have been alterated even at that level, because you know as you know Muslims were a minority and lived in garrison cities uh, and very far from each other, and uh, I think in many ways. The living tradition might have might have uh, might have retained certain elements, uh, but I don't think it captured all of them. Because uh, if we look at, for example, practice prayer practices in Zoroastrian Zoroastrianism, uh, and uh, in terms of the number, of the frequency, and the time of the day, they they actually are highly aligned with the five canonical prayers that we find in Islamic orthodoxy. Mm. 
So if the argument of critical historical scholarship regarding the Quran and its in, in, intertextuality, uh, that a lot of it was influenced by Zoroastrian and Persian motives, including the Zoroastrian religion, I could see how Zoroastrian ideas pertaining to prayer, at least in terms of its frequency and day, day and time, probably influenced strongly the, the, the living tradition. Therefore, the, this would imply that the living tradition was not strong enough and robust enough to survive this. I don't say it's a conspiracy, it's just that people who, uh, when Islam, for example, took hold in formerly Zoroastrian you know, Iraq and places, Mesopotamia, people who accepted Islam previously were practicing Zoroastrian religion. And therefore, they had certain affinity in relation to the existing ideas. So yeah. like they might have created a hybrid that was faithful to the, to the Zoroastrian uh, uh, kind of uh, religious sensibilities, but incorporated Islamic elements. Okay. And, and you see this... this and, yeah. and you see this with the uh, Zoroastrian cavalry that called the Asawira, if I'm saying that correctly, I probably butchered it, but the Zoroastrian cavalry that uh, eventually uh, converted to um, Islam, um, they still maintain their Zoroastrian names uh, and they were left unmolested about, uh, you know, totally dropping um, aspects of Zoroastrianism uh that they that they held firmly to so what you're saying i definitely can see how um it, it, it would cross over or make sense that there was some type of cross fertilization uh between yeah and late antiquity scholars for example have also said when we look at the material culture of the quran when it talks about the description of the paradise uh for example like uh, silver spoons banquets uh, green pillows all of these motives actually have very strong Persian kind of uh, way of thinking uh, rather than Arab uh, Hijazi kind of motives, yeah. yeah isn't Firdaus a uh, Persian? Yeah, Firdaus, a Persian name, yeah. The, the idea of, uh, you know, green pillows and flowing rivers and all of that uh, is very kind of evocative of of the kind of motives, religious motives we find in pre-Islamic Zoroastrian Mesopotamia. So if the Quran also adopted these and, and, and integrated them and adapted them, so it stands to reason that even forms of ritual prayer might have been affected as well. And uh, you say that... So which the... brings me to the... Which brings me, sorry, if we go back no, no, to go the ahead. concept of Sunnah, if we go back, go back to the concept of Sunnah, there is... Uh, as Professor Fazlur Rahman has argued, for example, it was something that, and I've tried to emphasize this idea that the concept of Sunnah, or at least one element, the ethical element, because I've talked about the, how to divide the concept of Sunnah into yeah, that's what I was gonna ethical, ask you yeah. Uh, so at least when it comes to at least one element of the concept of Sunnah uh, had to do with this idea of just a, 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 a it was an umbrella. It's a, it was um, it connoted something like what does it mean to be an upright believing person all right mm -hmm. so a very general ethical behavioral concept that was not ten very tangible it was something more abstract so imagine you have you you know someone you've known someone for 20 years yeah so you spent a lot of this been your friend uh, and you've been through thick and thin with them and if someone was to ask you, oh, how would you describe your friend? What was his character? What was his overall understanding of what does it mean to be a good human being? And you would say, well, he was such and such and such. You would describe that person in broad general terms, talk about his or her character, ethics. You, uh, so the concept of Sudna, to my mind, is best understood as this broad ethical behavioral concept of being a just person, being someone who values righteousness, someone who values uh, justice, someone who is compassionate. So I think the best way to understand Sunnah is along these lines. Mm. Yeah. And, and how these values might have been embodied by certain people in certain contexts, but it doesn't mean that these kind of practices ought to be imitated 
exactly in the same manner. What wow. what counts is is the, the those ethical terms and behavioral norms that underpin this concept. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the only way we should think about and retain this concept of sunnah uh, without getting uh, embroiled in all these discussions of authenticity, authenticity of hadith, and and honestly, many ethically highly questionable descriptions of the Prophet himself and the early Muslim community that we find in, in the hadith literature. And you also mentioned something I found interesting that Sunnah should not involve religious beliefs. Um, can you, mm -hmm. am, am, did, did I understand that correctly? Or uh, did yes. I? So how how do you go about that? This because because especially right now where hadith and the, the sunnah uh, has injected so so many theological views, um, how would how would we detach the sunnah from having and and would that mean that the Quran would be the only source for uh, theological or or okay how how would you because I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. Yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to wrap one's mind uh, around. Uh, so I, I appreciate the question. Now remember in progressive Muslim thought, which is uh, uh, in terms of the philosophy of religion that underpins it, it uh, the, the pro process relational panentheistic view of the divine, it doesn't even need a scripture in terms yeah. of kind of as, as in terms of establishing or thinking about God and and, uh, and 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 like theological concepts and ideas it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't even uh require the quran in order to um, exist or to articulate itself mm. but the quran still does um uh play an important role in 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 the islamic uh variation of process relational thought and um uh, the, uh, in progressive Islam, Quran and Sunnah, in terms of their epistemological underpinnings, there is no uh, differentiation between them whatsoever. Mm. So the, the 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 manner in which Quran and Sunnah emerged or were transmitted is exactly the same. Is through communal communal channels, mm. not textualist channels. Uh, but a, a, a hadith concept, uh, maybe a, a, a hadith-based or hadith-dependent concept of sunnah uh, assumes that the theological material that we find in the hadith is equated with sunnah and therefore is a valid and legitimate source of theological thinking. But for progressive Muslim thought, because sunnah is not linked to a textualist hermeneutic, Therefore, um, non-Quranic theological uh, sources, uh, non-Quranic textualist sources that have theological ideas in them um, would not be considered as part of evidence uh, unless they are in tune with process relational Theology. So if you have a hadith that talks about the God as being your beloved, uh, then that is in view, that is that is acceptable. But it is fil filtered through the process relational philosophy and nature of the divine and Quranic material that is also in tune with the same uh, uh, theological approach. And because Quran and Sunnah in progressive Muslim thought are two sides of the same coin, um, the distinction that I made here is more kind of rhetorical in a sense. It only holds value if uh, uh, if we made if we don't make the distinction that the progressive Islam makes mm -hmm. in relation to Sunnah and Hadith. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, I, I might have to work through it a bit uh, more yeah uh, i didn't i didn't explain it really well because um we don't have a textualist expression of the sunnah yeah mm. so to to look for theological beliefs in the uh, in sunnah they do not exist because we don't have a textualist uh, 
uh, rendering or expression of the Sunnah. We, we, all, we only have theological ideas in the Quran that potentially we can use as sources of theological thinking in progressive Muslim thought. But we may, uh, hadith, on the other hand, have a more, much more problematic uh, 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 provenance and genealogy compared to the Quran. Therefore, any theological ideas that we find in them are a priori rejected, whereas in the Quran, they are not a priori rejected. Uh, in the Quran, they are fil filtered through that process relational theological framework, and the, the, the intratextuality of the Quran is being taken into account. And we all know, and as I mentioned previously, the Quran doesn't provide us with conceptual or definitional forms of knowledge. So even in the Quran, even if the Quran talks about certain beliefs, um, uh, like, you know, uh, day of judgment or heaven or hell, they are not taken literally, and they are taken as an expression of already existing ideas mm. that uh, Quran is a continuation of, yeah, and a reaction to. And the Quran doesn't say that it's bringing anything new. I always like mm. to reiterate that point. It always comes mm. as, it mentions about itself that it's a confirmation, it's a reminder. And, you know, we know of verses where a uh, man is always uh, said to be very forgetful. So um, I, I'm not, exp I'm actually, when you look at uh, Islam or the emergence of Islam through a late antique lens, um, it's not hard to, it's not hard to understand that or see that. But yeah. I do have. <laughs> No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I would even argue that because the Quran is such a kind of a dialectical, dialogical um, discourse, you would find that in certain parts of the, there are certain, well, you know, many uh, Orientalists have said, you know, the Quran is such a contradictory text because in one part it says one thing, in another part it says exactly the opposite. Because they didn't appreciate its dialogical and dialectical nature. Mm. So it that's the, the it is possible to reconcile these apparent contradictions uh, in the Quran by simply uh, affirming the fact that the Quran, the different parts of the Quran emerged in different contexts, and they were part of our ongoing dialogical and dialectical exchange between, uh, uh, let's say, religious communities who were part of Quranic uh, audience of listeners. So uh, the Quran is reflective and exemplifies these, these debates. Okay, and uh, not to hold you up too much longer, uh, this has yeah. been an excellent conversation. And to be honest, I have like a lot more questions, but probably not capable of framing them the way that I want to at the moment. Again, uh, progressive Islamic thought is something that uh, is, is very new to me, but I find it very appealing and hope to learn a lot more uh, via your works and many other people's works who you've uh, introduced me to. But I am curious, let's say the Sunnah hadn't changed uh, in, in the first four centuries and it's still uh, how it how it's still today how it was back then how, how do you see it functioning within the muslim community uh, of, of muslims practicing the sunnah if it hadn't changed um say given all of what you mentioned throughout this conversation we take into consideration how would you see the sunnah functioning today yes so if we look uh, as i mentioned earlier on the concept of sunnah was a polysemic it had many meanings, it was used in many different contexts, which suggests that it's a, it's a concept that can evolve, that, uh, that can adapt itself to different contexts. And I think the best possible way to think of the concept of Sunnah is to frame it in, in, ethical, in, in ethical terms, in abstract ethical terms and con to connect it with the ideas of, 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 uh, of justice, of, of being the, the most ethical person one can be, uh, you know, linking it to these ethical values that are timeless in nature. 
And I think this is how we would do justice to to the best of the legacy uh, of 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 the of the people who have been associated with the concept of Sunnah historically in our tradition. So rather we should resist the urge to reify this concept and say that the Sunnah means this, uh, this particular practice and it can never change, uh, or Sunnah has to do with a particular hairstyle or particular way of dressing, or as I said, even a particular practice. So, we value, yeah, so we can say that, uh, we can say that Sunnah values devotion to God and prayer, but in what form that takes, uh, one can accommodate a variety of different understandings of what devotion means, what forms of prayers. Uh, so it kind of tries to de-reify it and de-link it from a particular historical practice that might have been prevalent at a particular point in time. So it seems the like way it de universalizes I, it as well. De, to uh, where... Not necessarily, because like in, in, in Sufi thought, the idea of the Sunnah of the Beloved, for example, mm. is very prominent. And I think Sufis here have honored the best aspects of what we should actually consider to be Sunnah. It's the idea of being in love with goodness, being in love with righteousness, being in love with the divine, mm. being, you know, a being an eth ethically upright person, being a good neighbor, being a good uh, citizen of the world, being a, you know having a cosmopolitan identity, being inclusivist, being being um, of 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 what couple of hadith you know talk about uh, husnul akhlaq, the, the being like uh, being the best in akhlaq essentially, mm -hmm. and so so I think that is the only way. We could, if you want to use the word rescue, but I wouldn't use the word rescue because the Islamic, as I said, intellectual tradition, in, it, it does hint very strongly that the concept of Sunnah was in the beginning understood as something more abstract, something that had to do with ethical behavior, something that had to do with standing up for justice, something that had to do with being the best person you can possibly be. But it did have, it did have the, let's say the, you know, you, you're talking about the Salat in particular. It did have that ritualistic dimension, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the particular practices and and the, 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 the exercising of that ritual ought never never to be changed and ought it ought to be always, uh, it always re has to remain the same. Mm. Uh, particularly, as I said, given the, the what we know about the the fragility of the living tradition and how it was exposed to hybridity and that you know uh, as we talked about earlier on and it was perhaps never meant to be uh in terms of the actual practices themselves uh, it was never perhaps meant to be uh, uh given just one form and one expression and we see certain differences is in certain sects in islam well now maybe they might not be considered as uh you know part of the islamic tradition like some of the more outlying sects like the ismailis or the druze they have different approach to the concept of prayer yeah uh, uh not like uh not like in islamic orthodoxy so while the concept of prayer and devotion is still important, the way it expresses itself uh, and the way it manifests itself can change. You know, actually, the Ismail, since you brought them up, Ismailis seem like, uh, I don't want to say they imbibe, progress, but it seems like they're, they're also not, uh, they, they also don't see authenticity as found in, in the past, um, something that I've noticed, and also uh, their understanding of the Quran um, from uh, what you shared with me from your blog site, uh, which I recommend people to go read because it, it read almost like how Ismailis understand the Quran that, uh, you know, God gives the, the the mechanisms, but as they're filtered through the, the vehicle, or in this case, the prophet, you know, he, he's going to, um, he, he interprets it, how, how he understands it for the audience to, to understand. It's like, um, 
I, I hope I'm conveying that right. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You, you are, you are, and I do see lots of affinities. But having said that, there were quite fundamentalist Ismaili scholars in the past as well, who were very fun. You had, they had a fundamentalist mindset. No, definitely. One of the Fatimid, one of the Fatimid ones. Yeah. But I mean, contemporary Ismaili thought, uh, or even they are obviously they have certain differences, but it's much more pluralistic, cosmopolitan. Yeah. And then, yeah, the, the, the concept of Al-Kitab is much more kind of, let's say, uh, like my, my our good friend, you know, Khalil uh, Andani. Andani, yeah, he talks about, he gives the analogy of the GPS, you know, how yeah. when you, as you are going around, like if you take a different street, the GPS guides you a different way, it's kind of a, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, con, uh, concomitant, not concomitant, like a, um, it um, contemporaneous it's a kind of contemporaneous feedback loop kind of thing yeah so I do find that uh, quite an appealing analogy uh, but again um, I'm not sure how we ended up talking about that I've lost my uh, oh sorry I just because uh, you, you mentioned yeah. something about the Ismailis and I just noticed that maybe yeah, certain yeah. Aspects so of basically modern Ismailis. yeah yeah so um, I, I know some of these ideas that I just talked about a very radical, but if we broaden our horizons and we look, we examine the full spectrum of Islamic intellect, uh, of the Islamic uh, phenomenon, and, you know, we see that there are certain communities that have radically departed from the orthodoxy, yet they still uh, consider themselves as part of the tradition, they, they still uh, value and honor uh, the Islamic uh, intellectual and religious cultural heritage. So instead of always using the, the predominant uh, uh, paradigm as, uh, as, 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 as a uh, point of reference, we should be willing to um, explore the full extent of, of the uh, of the historical experience of Muslim societies, civilizations, and groups, and and different approaches, and and uh, you know you've probably heard of uh, Shahad, 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 Shahad Ahmed's book. Oh yeah, I mean his, his book. I, yeah. Although I only read like half of his book, "What Is Islam?" Yeah. I, I plan to reread it again. An excellent, excellent, excellent uh, demonstration of the real richness and and the variety of of Islam meaning making, that's the word uh, professor, the late professor used, Islam meaning making is much, much broader than what Islamic orthodoxy wants us to believe. Definitely. And uh, yeah. we're, we're in a better position now than ever to actually look back at, at the past and at every aspect of it in order to better understand our present and create a better future. <laughs> Yeah, and I think uh, from, from the perspective of progressive Muslim thought, and maybe some of my progressive Muslim interlocutors might uh, disagree here with me, but critical historical scholarship should not be seen as an enemy to religious faith. Mm, definitely. Uh, uh, because, I mean, even from the perspective of mainstream Islam, there is this well-accepted belief that God has, you know, revealed, revealed in whatever way we want to understand the concept of revelation, uh, himself, or it's you know the divine self, in in many different ways, in many different communities, over a very long period of time, in different contexts. So, critical historical scholarship, what can it do to religious faith? It can basically say that scripture is a product of historical processes of intertextuality, hybridity, but it doesn't necessarily negate the basic premises of any religious faith. Of the, like the very basic premises of the of the, the existence of the divine, and everything else is inter up to interpretation. Every concept, every 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 concept that we are uh, that that you know religious scholars have talked about, it's a it's a construct. Even the concept of tawhid, the every concept, Trinity, tawhid, who is a prophet? What does it mean? What's a prophet? Any, all of these are concepts that are at the end of the day a product of interpretation by human beings and human agency so i think if anything muslim tradition is in in well positioned to accept many of these criticisms of critical historical scholarship if it is willing to 
bring down the Quran from its pedestal as being a purely you know, verbatim word of God, which I yeah. think, as we know, is itself a construction that took hundreds of years to develop. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and that's why uh, my channel is geared towards um, showcasing uh, critical academic scholarship, just because I feel like a lot of Muslims, they feel some type of way about it, uh, as if it's trying to undermine Islam. But in my investigation, I feel like it's totally enriched uh, my understanding. And um, Adis, Professor, thank you for speaking with me, meeting with me on my platform. You totally have brought value to my channel, and I hope many people benefit from this discussion. Uh, I will give you the final word. Uh, um, where can people find you? What do you have um, upcoming? And uh, wh where do you see progressive Islam uh, going? H how do you see it progressing in the future? Or where, yeah, thank it, you so where it's going yeah. in the future? Sure. Look, I, first of all, I want to express my gratitude and thanks to you, Tyrone because you, 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 you were brave enough uh, and, 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 uh, and um, wise enough to perhaps scratch below the surface and, and, and look beyond the stereotypes that exist with respect to progressive Islam and progressive Muslim thought. So thank you so wholeheartedly for, for giving progressive Muslim thought and progressive Islam a serious look. Uh, on a personal note, in terms of my scholarship, I have I'm, I have just finished editing, co-editing a book on the concept of modesty in Islam, which will be uh, the most comprehensive, uh, with some colleagues in Europe, uh, com most comprehensive treatment of the concept of modesty. And it's very timely given what's been happening. Yeah, I was about to say, it's arts. perfect timing to come out yeah. with such a <laughs> And another book on, on it's more interreligious in nature, uh, in terms of its scope. Um, but me personally, uh, where I want to take progressive Muslim thought in the future is definitely to explore further the concept and the idea of intertextuality of the Quran and to develop a more systematic engagement or, or kind of to develop synergies between process relational thought and the Islamic intellectual tradition to, to discover synergies and to extrapolate on them and to develop them uh, more and more into the future. Okay, well, thank you for your time and thank you for all your hard work. It's greatly appreciated. And um, I hope that we can meet again and discuss many other aspects of progressive Islamic thought because I don't think it's going anywhere. And as the, the way the future looks, um, I believe more and more people will find this way of thinking appealing yeah. in order to deal with the problems that we find ourselves in today. So again, thank you, Professor, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, because it might be kind of late on your time. Uh, the day only started for me, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a real pleasure, and um, I hope uh, we, we will keep in touch. Oh, definitely we will. Well, I have you on Facebook, and people can yeah. find you on Facebook. You are active, and you definitely post very many thought-provoking things uh, to get people to think about. So uh, again, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, it's just a reminder to myself first and foremost, and then <laughs> I share it with others for what it's worth. Okay, no, well, it's worth a lot. And again, assalamu alaikum. Uh, hope to speak to you again. Wa alaikum salam, and nice to meet you again.